Good Thursday morning. Thanks for being here. I'm Stephen Romo in for Joe and Savannah today. Right now on Morning News Now, death toll rises. More than 70 people are now dead after that brutal holiday storm that made its way across the country. More than half of those deaths happened in the Buffalo area where the snow is starting to melt. But a new problem, flooding. Now a major concern as well as the possibility that more bodies could be found. We have the latest from Buffalo and the efforts to clean up that area. Travel nightmare four days in and Southwest Airlines is still canceling flights. More than 2,000 already today and many passengers still stranded at airports. Well, their bags are also spread out across the country. What we're learning about the efforts to get the airline schedule back on track and the new help other airlines are offering to passengers this morning. Prayers for Benedict. There's support from around the world this morning after the Vatican reveals that former Pope Benedict's health is worsening. We're live in Rome with the latest on his condition and the impact this has on the Catholic Church. Also this morning, a year of sports. From the Winter Olympics to the World Cup, 2022 was a year full of exciting moments in sports. We'll take a look back at the biggest moments of the year and what will go down in the history books. But we do begin this morning with the latest from Buffalo, where they are finally getting a break from all that snow as warmer temperatures set in. But that now brings a whole new concern, the potential for flooding. The city has been able to dig out enough so that authorities were able to lift the travel ban there this morning, allowing people to venture back out and restock on critical items like food and medication. But Buffalo's mayor is still urging people to stay off the roads this morning if they possibly can so that recovery efforts can continue. I'm asking people to still be cautious. And if you don't need to drive, Please don't. A travel advisory will be in place as the storm cleanup continues and lots of equipment will be on city streets hauling and removing snow. Well, the warmer weather in the area may also allow crews to complete more search and rescue missions today. Right now, more than 30 people are confirmed dead as a result of that storm in the Buffalo area. And that number is expected to rise as rescue crews reach cars that are snuck in snow drifts across the city. Well, the higher temperatures are also causing that threat of flooding we mentioned from the melting snow, which could disrupt the cleanup process. And this morning, as recovery continues from last week's weather, the trouble is ongoing at airports across the country. Delays and cancellations continue to mount specifically for Southwest Airlines customers as some flyers are still trying to find their way home even now days after Christmas. We have full coverage of all this. We'll check in with meteorologist Angie Lassman for the forecast in just a moment. But we're going to start with NBC News correspondent Marissa Parra, who is in Buffalo for us this morning. Marissa, thanks for joining us. So that ban on driving has finally been lifted there in Buffalo. But we do, do we know how that's going to affect the cleanup process? Because more cars on the road could slow the whole thing down, right? Right. So it's kind of hard to say because it depends, right? So looking into a crystal ball is a little difficult. But what I can say is that in as part of the decision making process, if you will, when they decide to lift the driving ban, part of the decision making process, they look at the streets that are cleared. And that's one of the reasons why they waited to lift the driving ban as long as they did. And so they needed to clear most of the streets to a good enough point where other cars can drive through while they're obviously still working on clearing roads. I mean, we're standing over here on the sidewalk. You can see on either side of the sidewalk some of that snow that's piled up right on either side of me. Um, and there are some streets that have this on the sidewalks and maybe they're trying to move it off of the sidewalks now. They're just trying to maybe go through the process of going through some of those back corner streets and side streets that they didn't have a chance to get to. So, I mean, it's not going to make it easier when there's other people on the road, but I don't think that they would have made the decision if if they hadn't made enough progress. Yeah, much needed progress there. And we also know that temperatures will be on the rise there as we head into the weekend. It seems like that could help things, but that also brings us talking about the potential for flooding. What are in officials anticipating there? 
Yeah, I mean, this is an instance of too much of a good thing too fast. You think on the surface here, rising temperatures with all of this snow is a good thing, right? You have snow in places that you don't want it to be. So when you have those rising temperatures that causes it to melt, the problem is there was so much snow and these temperatures are rising so fast, especially looking at temperatures upwards of the 50s uh, coming up this weekend, in addition to rain. So when we talk about the strategy of moving the snow around, I want to take you to Lackawanna city mayor. This is a city further south from Buffalo, also saw a lot of snow. Take a listen to what they're doing as they're trying to move the snow out of the streets and into places that won't cause a problem. This is what they're pulling off of the streets and um, trying to get it opened up so the people can start moving around again. We dump it here because there's nothing here and when it melts, it's not going to damage anything. So one big concern here is not just the flooding potential in general on the streets, but also the possibility that some of these homes filled with people who have been through so much lack of food, maybe lack of electricity, might be facing flooded basements on top of everything else. So uh, we know that New York Governor Hochul has deployed state resources and aid, which includes 800,000 sandbags as well as generators and pumps to try to avoid that from happening. Such a mess. And Marissa, I did want to ask you quickly here. We know residents have been stuck there in their homes, many of them now needing to get out and get more supplies. How are they doing? How are residents coping? It's a great question. I mean, I will say that I've had a chance now to speak with residents on the ground walking around here. Um, I have not personally spoken to people who are still trapped in their homes. We understand that the number of people who are still facing power outages, that number gets less and less and less. Um, at last check, it was around 500, and it's probably gone down since that time was uh, updated. But I think right now there's a sort of shell shock, mm. just seeing the death toll, knowing that that number could very well rise. Mm. So disturbing. Our hearts are definitely with the people of the Buffalo area. Marissa Parra, thanks so much. All right, let's get caught up now on your morning news now weather. Meteorologist Angie Glassman joins us now with a look at how things are shaping up as we do head into the weekend. Yeah, we're heading into a warm and wet weekend for many across the country. Here's what's going on as far as that warmth. We're going to wrap up the year with temperatures well above normal. 10, 20 degrees higher than they should be for this time of year. Chicago will hit 55 degrees later today, 59 in Lexington and 71 degrees in Jacksonville. A whole lot different than how we started this work week. As we head into your Friday, temperatures in the high 50s in Washington, D.C., Charlotte at 60 degrees. We look towards the, the um, Midwest and St. Louis, not quite as warm as the east, but still 48 degrees and above normal for this time of year. And this trend lasts all the way through the weekend. Your Saturday, your Sunday, and your Monday will be on the warm side of things for this time of year. So relative speaking will be much warmer in Cleveland at 50 on Saturday heading into the new year with 46 degrees on Sunday so the warmer air is in place that of course uh, is a positive for many folks on the East Coast but the wetter conditions are going to settle in for many as well here's the rainfall forecast expected for folks on the West Coast from Seattle down to, to parts of uh, Central and Southern California we're expecting anywhere from two to three inches of rain on top of already saturated soils from uh, numerous storm systems that have worked in on uh, on shore over the past couple of days and will continue to do so as we head into Saturday, Sunday, and even into Monday of next week. One to three feet of snow expected in places like the Sierras, so just be careful with that if you're going to be out and about in those areas. We also have another storm system that's going to work across the midsection of the country. That on the northern side will bring anywhere from one to four inches of snow for folks in the northern plains. Uh, Texas, Arkansas, and Louisiana, though, they'll have the potential to see some severe storms, and then that, that'll wrap up here as we get into today, uh, the later parts of today, as we head into tomorrow, the rain. Unfortunately, Stephen continues to move off to the east, and we're talking about a soggy Saturday. Folks that are maybe heading to see the ball drop or things like that um, need to pack their rain gear because we'll, we'll have it in place Ooh. for really after midnight and beyond. It's honestly kind of miserable in Times Square anyway. Add the rain yeah. in. Make sure you get those umbrellas. If <laughs> Tell you're us how there. you really feel. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's no secret. All right. Thanks so much, Angie. All right. Turning now to the latest on Southwest Airlines and all the travel chaos flyers have been seeing. Many still scrambling to find their way home after thousands of flight cancellations and hundreds of reported delays. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander shows us what passengers are dealing with right now and when it could all clear up. 
Well, good morning. This has certainly become the familiar and frustrating scene for so many travelers. Today, again, Southwest has canceled about 2,300 flights, just over 2,300 flights. Uh, and so certainly that means that people are trying to find different ways to get back home, but also trying to get reunited with their luggage. Now, as this continues, as it has for most of the week, more Southwest executives are speaking out. One, apologizing for this travel backlog that's left many thousands of passengers stranded, but also trying to provide resources, essentially uh, saying that passengers can go online, try and figure out different ways to reunite with their luggage, and also telling them what they are entitled to, not only if they're stranded in a city, but also if they had to come out of pocket for different expenses. We spoke with one woman who says that she and her family had to rent a car and then buy six airline tickets in order to get home on a different carrier. All told, those exposes, expenses came out to be nearly $3,000, so they're looking for some sort of reimbursement there. Now, remember, the transportation department said that they are looking into this and the Biden administration is putting pressure on Southwest to reimburse these passengers financially for a great deal of inconvenience this week. Back to you. So much to sort out. Blaine, thank you. All right, turning now to the Vatican, where doctors are closely monitoring the health of a 95-year-old Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. Vatican officials say the retired Pope is quite sick at the moment, but his condition remains under control. We have NBC News Vatican analyst Deborah Lubov joining us now, as well as NBC News correspondent Claudio Lavanga, who joins us from Rome. Thank you both so much for being here. Claudio, let's start with you. What's the latest that we know this morning on Benedict, and what's the reaction to all his concerning health news? Good morning, Stephen. Well, after yesterday's confirmation by the Vatican through a statement that the Pope Benedict XVI's health is deteriorating or has deteriorated in the last few hours due to age, well, they haven't released any update yet. Uh, we may get something in an hour or so, but I'll keep you posted. But in the meantime, what we heard that is new is from Italy's news, main news agency, ANSA, uh, which said that according to sources within the monastery inside the Vatican walls behind me where Pope Benedict XVI has lived since he retired in 2013, well, he's started having respiratory or breathing problems a few days ago, and that's when he started deteriorating, uh, that the condition overnight has not changed, but it, it remains serious and stable. As per how the faithful has reacted, have reacted, well, I can tell you around here, I uh, was in St. Peter's Square this morning. It was, it was as business as usual with tourists, the faithful, taking pictures, saying prayers, but many didn't seem to be aware that Benedict XVI is uh, very sick, as Pope Francis said yesterday, but I'm sure that many around the world, Catholics I'm talking about, uh, will be following the Pope's suggestion to pray a special prayer for Pope Benedict, Stephen. All right, Deborah, let's bring you in here. We know Pope Benedict was the first pope in 600 years to retire. So this has all been uncharted territory for almost a decade now, having both the pope and a pope emeritus, as Benedict was called. Are there any protocols or rules that are unique in this unprecedented situation? I suppose the uniqueness, Stephen, would be frankly, the fact that there are none. And Pope Francis has had no desire to change that, saying even in a recent interview that he doesn't feel uh, called by the Holy Spirit to uh, implement such rules relating to retired folks popes for the time being. So while for a reigning pope, when they uh, eventually die or choose to resign, but when they when they pass away, there is a Vatican document called University Dominici Gregis, which completely governs every single step and element of what happens from the moment of death up until the election of the upcoming pope. Whereas in this case, with a retired pope who is no longer pope and no longer head of state, we would expect something um, important and ceremonial, obviously, most likely presided over um, by Pope Francis at the funeral mass. But we would have to wait and see what is um, told by the Holy See Press Office, by the director, Matteo Bruni, or what Pope Francis possibly could share himself or what Pope uh, Benedict, uh, what his wishes are. So it's all kind of um, a wait and see. Wait and see for a complicated process. Claudio, do we know how Pope Francis is handling this situation? We know he's had some medical issues of his own. Do we know how, how his health is now? 
Well, that's right, Stephen. Well, you know that Pope Francis has had his share of health problems as well. You may remember a year and a half ago, he underwent colon surgery, from which he seemed to have recovered fine. But recently, in the last few months, his knee problems have worsened to the point that it's, it's made it very difficult for him to walk. Now, nowadays, he walks with a cane. Many times we've seen him uh, on a wheelchair. Uh, so that's the main problem that he's experiencing. But the most surprising thing perhaps was to hear from him during an interview to a Spanish newspaper recently that right after he was elected Pope in 2013, he uh, signed a resignation letter that he handed to the Secretary of State here at the Vatican to be used in case in the future his health problems, whatever they could be, uh, made, him, uh, made it impossible for him to fulfill his ministry. Stephen? Hmm, quite concerning. And, and Deborah, just taking a wider view of all this, if you could help us put Pope Benedict's time as Pope in context, a lot of unprecedented things, as we've said. So what kind of legacy did he leave when he did step down? Well, certainly a legacy that no one was expecting because this Pope who had this reputation as someone who is very traditional, a guardian of the faith, conservative values, all of a sudden takes this radical decision after eight years of leaning the Catholic Church to, to resign. And some try to suggest as though he, he tried to get away from scandals or difficulties. But on the other hand, he had expressed he had had a pontificate full of all these challenges, yet he, he pushed through, even despite the fact that he was constantly being, and to some extent, ridiculed by the press. But he um, has been really loved. And I think that's a narrative that um, we're seeing now as everyone is praying for him. And you see all the stories pouring in across the world to pray for him and people who said I converted because of him. And I know even personally, when I've met him one-on-one, uh, -on -one, he's a very gentle soul, if you will. And um, I think his legacy will be one of sort of this uh, very scholarly, professor-like uh, Pope who really has wanted to show the the love of Christ and the truth to the world. And even if many uh, don't necessarily agree with him, uh, people respect people who hold on to who they are to some extent uh, and their values. So I think that's what it's about. Uh, quite a legacy. All right, we'll continue to follow updates mm -hmm. on this. Claudio Lavanga and Deborah Luboff, thank you both so much. All right, turning now to the latest on Ukraine, which is dealing with another wave of Russian strikes, a barrage of missiles filed at different regions, according to Ukrainian officials. And among the cities targeted was the capital of Kiev. That's where we find NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley. Matt, good morning to you. So what's the situation like right now where you are and what do we know about damage or injuries there? Yeah, well, I'm standing in one of the, actually a public park in the middle of a residential neighborhood. This is where kids play, and right behind me was where a lot of the debris fell. And when I say debris, I don't mean an actual missile. Now, there was, you know, something like 69 missiles fired all across the country today. Uh, a lot of them, most of them, 54 of them were actually intercepted. So when I talk about debris, I'm talking about the missile fired by the Russians was hit by a Ukrainian anti-aircraft system. And all of that has to go somewhere. Some of it landed right here, right behind me. It's already gone. The officials came here, they picked it up. But take a look over here, Stephen. This is very much a park. Children play here. And actually, kind of ironically, if you can see this behind me, they call this Rocket Park. Uh, mm. This is because of that shape there. But, the, you know, this is a place, we talked to some people around here. There's kids here. Um, and they were saying they were lucky that it didn't hit an actual residential building. But if you can imagine, if some of that falling debris struck here during daylight hours when kids were playing here, it would have been a nightmare for the parents. And I talked with one man, and he said, you know, he's been taking it kind of lax when it comes to going to the uh, bomb shelters. And now, he said this morning, he really learned his lesson now. From now on, he's going to be hustling down to the bomb shelters. So concerning to see the playground behind you talking about all this debris. Uh, there have also been reports of explosions across the country. So do we know what's going on outside of Kyiv? And how are Ukraine's air defenses handling these strikes? Yeah, well, I mean, the whole country was impacted. And, you know, I got to tell you, Stephen, this is something that a lot of folks here were waiting for, the other foot to drop, because... This has been a, quite a while, about two weeks, maybe more, since the last really comprehensive Russian attack nationwide. Here in Kyiv, uh, and, and again, you know, Stephen, all of this has been, for the most part, targeting electricity infrastructure. Vladimir Putin has really been quite explicit about his intentions and his targets. They want to, uh, to basically turn the lights out for Ukrainians, sap their will by 
keeping them in the dark, quite literally. And so that's why here in Kyiv, as a result of the bombardment today, 40 percent of households are without electricity. In Lviv, to the east, it's something like 90 percent. So even though they've been really, the Ukrainians have managed to shoot down a lot of these Russian missiles, they've been very devastatingly effective in turning out the lights. So many power outages. And Matt, this attack comes after Moscow rejected President Zelensky's 10-point peace plan, which he had been promoting to different world leaders. What did that include, and do we know why the Kremlin just decided to dismiss it entirely? Well, we know exactly why the Kremlin dismissed it, because it's going to, it would essentially roll back and even push back further their goals for their special military operation. You know, the 10-point peace plan, among other things, it was that, you know, the Russians would uh, surrender all of the territory that they had taken, not just now in 2020 at the beginning of the fight, but all the way back to 2014. That includes most, most of the Donbass region and Crimea. Uh, and then they also would be submitting themselves to essentially war crimes trials that, you know, they would be allowing themselves to be investigated and arrested. These are kind of, uh, this was sort of, from the Zelensky's point of view, uh, justice, retribution, but from the Russians, kind of a pie-in-the-sky request. Hmm. Pie-in-the-sky request, uh, peace plan, uh, much needed, much sought after. We'll see if another one is able to hold. Matt Bradley, thanks so much. All right, newly elected Congressman George Santos is now being investigated after admitting to misrepresenting his resume while campaigning. In a statement, Nassau County District Attorney Ann Donnelly said, quote, the third district must have an honest and accountable representative in Congress and that, quote, no one was above the law. This move comes after the New York Times released a bombshell report on Santos in which they reported that he embellished some of his background, including details about his employment and where he went to school. Santos has apologized for embellishing his resume and said he had made mistakes, but he has not responded to specific requests for comments on these details. Well, coming up on Morning News Now, new COVID rules. The U.S. now requiring COVID testing for anyone arriving from China. What's behind that new restriction? And if this means more COVID policies could make a return. That's next. Welcome back. Police in Idaho are investigating new leads and sorting through thousands of tips trying to find a suspect in the murder of four local college students. This while also working to clear up widespread speculation circulating online about one particular professor saying they don't believe she's involved at all. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson has the latest. Idaho police making a plea to the public to help solve the quadruple murders in Moscow, Idaho. In a press release stating their focus, quote, remains on the investigation, not an individual's activities displayed in the tip, and to keep sharing, writing, your information might be one of the puzzle pieces that helps solve these murders. Also, still pursuing that 2011 to 2013 white Hyundai Elantra. Authorities say they have looked into more than 22,000 cars since identifying the car as a potential lead, and that they think the occupant of the car may have, quote, critical information. We just want to talk to that person or persons in that vehicle um, to see what they may know. In the six weeks following, police have yet to publicly identify any suspect, but now they are trying to clear up speculation around one person, a University of Idaho professor, Rebecca Schofield, the police saying at this time in the investigation, they do not believe she's involved in the crime. Schofield was accused of the murders in videos by a self-described TikTok internet sleuth who uses tarot cards, she says, helps solve crimes. Well, Rebecca Schofield, the one who murdered the four Idaho college students, see my videos. The videos were reposted and viewed by millions. The professor filed a defamation lawsuit denying any wrongdoing after the user refused to take down the videos. In the lawsuit, Schofield alleges her reputation was injured and that she was, quote, subject to online ridicule and threats from online commenters and now fears that she or her family will be the target of physical violence. It's just another example of the police responding to the tremendous amount of misinformation surrounding this case. They even have a rumor control site of their website. I think rumors always hurt us um, in an investigation, but it's our job to go back and utilize our resources and to continue to vet those and make sure that all that information um, is still cataloged so that we have it. Their focus is now on the thousands of tips left to sort through, reporting more than 7,000 email tips, 4,000 phone tips, and 4,500 digital media submissions. The family of one of the slain students, Kaylee Gonzalez, still questioning what truly happened that night and if police are handling the investigation correctly. 
their attorney, telling NBC News in a text, trust is earned, and they need to remember that because the way they've handled things so far haven't garnered much trust. All right, our thanks to Steve Patterson for that report. Turning now to the latest on the pandemic and the growing concern around the spread of COVID cases in China. The CDC announced yesterday that any travelers entering the U.S. from China will be required to show a negative COVID test in order to get into the country. That move comes as new fears arise about the emergence of a new variant in China. The country has just relaxed its COVID restrictions in the past few weeks. That new testing requirement will go into effect in the U.S. on January 5th. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel joins us now for more on this. So, Dr. Patel, good morning. The last time we saw these travel restrictions like these was at the very start of the pandemic. So just how serious is this situation that the U.S. is putting these new rules into place? And is it possible we're going to see even more like this? Stephen, I think it's definitely serious, but probably serious for reasons that might not occur to many Americans. It's because not only are we seeing explosive numbers of cases in China, but we're also seeing those upticks in Europe and in the United States. And the goal with, unlike the early part of 2020, where we thought we could keep the infection out, now the goal is really to try to just decrease the burden of infections as much as possible. But in some cases, Stephen, Omicron is easy to give and to get. And that might make these restrictions even harder to have an effect. It's incredible. We're still talking about Omicron a year after it started yeah. popping up here. Those cases, meanwhile, rising in the U.S. We know some states are even bringing back mask mandates. The CDC says there are 100 million COVID cases in the country, but health officials say that actual total could be twice that. So just like a lot of people were asking, how did we get here again? Yeah, Stephen, I think a couple of things to take into context, though, is that even though I would love to see our vaccination numbers go much higher, especially people who got the updated vaccine, that we have now between people who have been vaccinated, hopefully more Americans boosted, especially listening to this message. And then on top of that, as you mentioned, 100 million, even higher number of infections. The United States has built a lot of immunity, and I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing such a stark contrast with China, with hundreds of thousands of cases a day, because their population had not had that exposure. So we're in a different place, but it's a one where we don't know the future, because we're all worried about that next variant that could pierce the immunity that I just described. We have not seen that yet. Big underscore on the yet. That's why we need to have a lot of this global surveillance so that we can watch and monitor, make sure we don't get that variant around the world or anywhere for that matter. And we've also been following the so-called triple demic for a while now, that surge of respiratory illnesses, flu, RSV that could possibly spike as we often see after the holidays. So short term and more long term, how do those illnesses actually affect our bodies and would wearing masks actually make a big difference? Yeah, we, yes, Stephen, good point to bring up. We know that masks can help with all of these kind of airborne, especially respiratory viruses, where we know these particles are just getting coughed or sneezed, and then they linger a little while in the air. But if you're close to somebody, that mask can help. And especially with COVID, even if you're far apart, that mask can help. Washing hands, that's something that we do as health professionals, just as a basic routine precaution. Everybody should do it, especially with RSV and flu, and then wiping down surfaces. The short-term effects are the ones we're seeing right now. People are out of work, people are out of school, people are missing holidays with loved ones because they're sick. The longer-term effects, not just long COVID, but if you get one or two or three of these viruses at the same time, we have to monitor to see what kind of inflammatory reactions people could have in the long range. All the reason to not get sick in the first place and try to avoid it. Absolutely. I know a lot of people who miss their Christmas plans due to being sick for some virus or another. Dr. Kafita Patel, thank you so much. All right, coming up, 2022 brought us two major sporting events, the Winter Olympics and the World Cup. But those weren't the only things that kept us glued to the world of sports this year. We'll take a look back at some of the biggest moments from Argentina's win to Serena Williams' retirement. Stick around.
And a lot more happened in the world of sports. 2022 proved to be an exciting year for fans, bookended by two of the biggest sporting events on the planet. The Beijing Winter Olympics, that kicked things off back in February before a thrilling World Cup in Qatar that just wrapped up the year in style. And here to talk about all this and some of the other biggest moments of the year is NBC sports host and reporter Ahmed Farid. Ahmed, thanks so much for being with us. Great to have you. So let's travel all the way back to the beginning of 2022 with the Winter Olympics, despite being fanless, of course, due to COVID-19. The Team USA, they didn't do too bad, right? Yeah, Stephen, great to talk to you this morning. Uh, yeah, you mentioned fanless, fan-free. Hopefully it's the last time we're saying that about an Olympic Games for for quite a while. But yeah, it was a very successful one for the Americans in a number of sports, a number of events, uh, men's figure skating. Nathan Shen, we saw, win a gold medal first for U.S. Uh, since 2010, and he was doing it with amazing tricks that we have never seen before in the sport quadruple flips a total of five quad jumps in his routine you know Michaela Schifrin was an athlete an alpine skier who we thought was going into these games it was a foregone conclusion she was going to win multiple medals and much like Simone Biles in the summer games that did not happen but I think what was striking about Michaela Schifrin is you know she competed in all the events she faced the questions afterwards and I think she really was an inspiration to all and how she handled the disappointment of really her worst meet ever, and it happened to be at an Olympic Games. Um, Sean White, one of the greatest of all time, snowboarder extraordinaire, competing in his final Olympic Games. He did not get a medal uh, as well, but man, what an emotional story, an emotional interview. He was passing the torch to the younger competitors afterwards. You could just see how much he meant to all the younger and how much of an inspiration he was to them. And and kind of moving on in the sport now, entering a new phase. Um, some of the stories, Stephen, that we're going to track going into Paris in a couple of years and four years, Italy, the participation of Russian athletes, that'll be a topic of conversation once again, and perhaps also age limits on some of these athletes. How young is too young for figure skaters and gymnasts and divers out there? Those are two of the conversations we'll be having leading up to the next Olympic Games. Seems like so long ago, hard to believe that was also this year. Much more recently, the World Cup ended just a few weeks ago. Argentina's and Lionel Messi won that tournament in a dramatic final game against France. Morocco also became the first Arab and first African team to reach the semifinal. So what were some of the standout moments for you from the World Cup? Yeah, Stephen, not as hard to believe that this happened this year. Yeah, we just got done with the World Cup. Um, I, I, what struck me is that... The whole world comes together, and I think some of the viewership numbers in years past for the final are over a billion people worldwide are watching this one sporting event. So there are still these major events, maybe none other than the Olympics and the World Cup that the whole world is glued to and can bring the whole world uh, together. Some of the big stories, I mean, here for us in the USA, Team USA advancing into the knockout. Uh, stage is not able to progress too far into that, but I think making steps as the next World Cup comes to North America, hopefully Team USA can take another step forward. I think the Premier League is so popular now here in America. We have it on, on NBC, tracking some of those English players and seeing Harry Kane miss a penalty and eventually uh, see them be eliminated by France. I think that was one of the big stories of, of the World Cup. And you mentioned Lionel Messi, one of the greatest of all time to do it. And you kind of wonder nowadays if these superstars can be born worldwide. I mean, are we all watching the same thing? Are we all glued to the same TVs? And I think Leo Messi is one of those players who they will be talking about for generations and generations. And we just saw perhaps his pinnacle moment in his last World Cup, hoisting that World Cup trophy. So uh, those are some of the big stories for the World Cup. And what struck me, Stephen, is just that how many people come together? I, some numbers say 3 billion people at least watch some part of the final every year. And so that is just amazing to me. Yeah, incredible numbers. And we do, Ahmed, want to talk about these two massive stories. We had to say goodbye to the world's greatest stars, tennis stars Serena Williams and Roger Federer, both bowed out of the game. What will these two be remembered for the most? I mean, it's crazy that they're they're both saying goodbye in basically the same year. And, and a lot of their numbers are so similar, Stephen. I was looking up some of the numbers for Serena, you know, ranked number one in singles for 319 weeks. 186 of those weeks were consecutive. I mean, we're talking, what, three over three years here. Uh, finished as the year end number one five times, 23 Grand Slam titles. Now, I do wonder if Serena really will stay away. She has, you know, she said she's stepping away. And retirement's not quite her word. And so 
I don't know. She's leaving the door open that we may see her professionally again, but it seems like the big schedule that she's had in years past, that is definitely uh, not happening again. And then on the men's side, you mentioned it. Roger Federer, some of his numbers, uh, ranked number one, 310 weeks, finished as the year-end number one, five times, 20 Grand Slam titles, eight Wimbledon titles, five U.S. Open titles, and I think one of the biggest pictures of the year. And there you have it, Roger crying in his last professional match and he actually was playing with Rafael Nadal who was also in tears at the same time and so seeing two of the greatest ever maybe the greatest ever in the sport of tennis on the women's and men's side uh, hang it up and, and walk away certainly impactful for a lot of the people who follow that sport Stephen. Legendary and a sliver of hope that we could see Serena play again. All right Ahmed thanks so much for that insight. Well, coming up on Morning News Now, banned on campus. Several universities now stopping students from using TikTok when they're at school. What's behind that ban and how it's being enforced? That's up next. Welcome back. Students at several state universities across the country are no longer able to access TikTok using campus Wi-Fi. Now, this move comes after governors in those states banned the popular social media app on state-run symptom systems. NBC News youth and internet culture reporter Callan Rosenblatt joins us now with more on this. Good morning, Callan. I know so many college students love TikTok. So many people love TikTok. So what kicked off this ban? So this ban comes amid growing cybersecurity scrutiny of TikTok. Now, we know that there is a credible reporting that TikTok, which is based in China, uh, you know, has credibly accessed uh, American journalist data, uh, or rather ByteDance employees, ByteDance is the parent company of TikTok, that those employees access uh, the data of U.S. journalists. So. There are a, a myriad of concerns about TikTok, again, being a foreign-based company accessing U.S. user data. There's also some issues with the privacy policy that you agree to when you sign up on TikTok, that there are concerns that this, uh, that, that ByteDance and TikTok may be obtaining U.S. user data. TikTok has long maintained that it only stores U.S. user data within the U.S., but these growing concerns that are happening in Congress with the FBI, uh, a lot of U.S. government agencies uh, are continuing to spur these state banning TikTok on state-owned official devices. It does seem hard to enforce. I was just the logistics of this. What about students' personal devices? Is, is it just the Wi-Fi access that they're not allowed to use TikTok on? So they're only not allowed to use TikTok on their on the school-owned Wi-Fi or school-owned devices. They'll still be able to access it on their private devices, but if you're a student who primarily uses Wi-Fi, it's going to be a real challenge to access the app. Now, my colleague Deja Tolentino and I have spoken to students who said this will not prevent them from accessing TikTok. They're going to find ways around it, whether it's a VPN or whether it's using their data. They plan to still find ways to access TikTok. So they consider this to be more frustrating than anything. And I've also seen some students even say if people were frustrated with the outcome of the midterms in terms of youth voters, uh, youth voters, they say that this will probably not help some of these uh, GOP-led states with youth voters in the future. Although these GOP-led states say they're just looking out for student cybersecurity. The love for TikTok is real for students and so <laughs> many. I know this isn't only limited to universities. What are some of those other government agencies that have banned TikTok? So the, the House has banned TikTok on official devices. So any House devices will not be able to access TikTok. The, the U.S. military banned it two years ago on official devices. And agencies like the FBI are also looking into TikTok. So there are various bans, including these 19 states who have banned TikTok on official devices. It seems like the scrutiny uh, over TikTok is growing more and more. And we may continue to see U.S. government agencies continue to ban it. But it does appear to be clear that students, young people, they have no desire to see this app go away and they will continue to find ways to access it. It's quite stark, like the difference between people who are concerned about it and the people who are not concerned about it still scrolling on TikTok. It's pretty addictive. All right, Callan Rosenblatt, thanks so much. 
2022 has been an incredible year of accomplishments for anyone involved in space exploration. It's been a memorable year from Artemis to the DART mission to the next generation of astronauts preparing for that return to the moon. NBC's Tom Costello has documented each and every moment in the year of space and brings us some of those highlights. Three, two, one, boosters in ignition and liftoff of Artemis 1. In a year of triumphs for space exploration, NASA's Artemis moon mission was the headline-grabbing finale, a 25-day, 1.4 million-mile test flight of the new Orion spaceship that will one day carry astronauts back to the moon, an 80-mile-high, high-resolution flyover of the moon, a long orbit deeper into space. Orion is right on the money coming right down the pike. Then a spectacular re-entry with the heat shield hitting 5,000 degrees. That's half the temperature of the sun. And there it is, high over the Pacific. Before a gentle parachute drop into the Pacific Ocean. Splashdown. It is the beginning of the new beginning, and that is to explore the heavens. That new beginning will include astronauts on a similar test flight around the moon in 2024. Then a lunar landing in 2025 or 26 with a crew that includes a woman and a person of color. The first return to the moon since those heady days of Apollo. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. But NASA is also leaning heavily on private companies. SpaceX now regularly launches both crew and cargo to the ISS. This is the view of Earth from the International Space Station and a simulator at NASA in Houston. Outside the cupola, the blue richness of Earth and the blackness, the deep blackness of space. And right there, the Canada arm, which has reached out to grab an incoming cargo vessel. And SpaceX is now working overtime on its Starship that will carry astronauts to the moon. Then perhaps Mars in the late 2030s. Another huge success in 2022, NASA's DART mission. And we have impact. The spacecraft in time lapse traveling at 14,000 miles per hour, slamming into a small asteroid named Dimorphos 7 million miles from Earth and pushing it ever so slightly off its orbit. A critical success if NASA hopes to one day deflect an incoming planet killing asteroid away from Earth. Now, this is a watershed moment for planetary defense and a watershed moment for humanity. But the most visual space achievement in 2022 were those spectacular images from the Deep Space James Webb Telescope. Using infrared cameras, we're now looking at light billions of years old. The creation of the universe, distant stars and galaxies, stunning nebulas, begging the question, are we alone? We could have an answer about whether or not there's life in the universe, which would change everything, right? Would change our would change our entire understanding of what we were and who we are in the universe. It's big and beckoning to a new generation of explorers. Tom Costello, NBC News, Houston. Very cool. And a programming note, be sure to check out Battlefield Space to the Moon and Beyond, hosted by our own Tom Costello. You can stream it now on the Peacock app. All right, now to some money news. Elon Musk is advising Tesla employees to ignore the stock market as Tesla declines. See some Tesla shares, rather, see some major declines. CNBC's Sylvana Hanau joins us now with that and other headlines. Good morning, Sylvana. Stephen, good morning to you. That's right. So Elon Musk tells Tesla employees not to be, quote, bothered by stock market craziness. The company's shares have dropped nearly 70 percent this year on jitters over lower demand for electric cars and Musk's distraction with Twitter. In an email obtained by CNBC, Musk says he believes over the long term Tesla will be the most valuable company on Earth. He's also urging employees to make a push to deliver as many vehicles as possible by the end of this quarter and year. 
The CEO of Goldman Sachs expects to cut jobs in early January. Bloomberg reports in his year-end letter to staff, David Solomon says the bank faces several challenges, including tighter financial conditions that are causing an economic slowdown. Now, it's been speculated Goldman may cut up to 8% of the workforce. That's about 4,000 jobs. But the exact number hasn't been decided and could end up being lower. Waze is testing new alerts warning drivers about roads that have a history of crashes. Tech news site GeekTime says nearby roads that are deemed high risk are colored red on the map. Now, the feature only pushes out one pop-up notification, and that's possibly in an effort to keep drivers from becoming too anxious. The alerts appear to only be in beta testing in Israel, but are expected to be rolled out to the general public very soon, Stephen. Could be useful. Yeah, not bad. The red yeah. usually to me means traffic, so it has right. to be used so to that. I, they're pro exactly. They're probably going to uh, work on that a little bit. We'll Color see what code. happens. Yeah, we'll yeah. see. All right. Savannah, thanks so much. Yeah. All right, coming up, the moments that made us smile in 2022. From the return of Benefer, didn't see that one coming, to that viral Wednesday dance. Our social media feeds were full of content that just keeps us talking. We're taking a look back. Coming up next. Welcome back. 2022 may have had its fair share of rough patches, but between viral moments, record-breaking events, and an endless supply of new memes, there were no shortage of moments that made us smile this year. Culture editor at Rolling Stone, Elizabeth Garber-Paul, joins us now to discuss some of our favorite moments of the past 12 months. So good morning, Elizabeth. Thanks for being here. There, was, there were plenty of bad headlines, but let's try to focus on the happy ones in the celebrity world. There were plenty of those as well. What were some that kept us talking? So thank you so much for having me. Uh, one of the ones that we've got on our list today uh, is Rihanna's baby announcement. Um, she had this very bold photo shoot. I mean, obviously, she's not the first person to uh, do a photo shoot for a baby announcement, but um, there was just something about her bare belly in public in Manhattan with ASAP Rocky that was just uh, so inspiring and seemed to kind of kick off a trend of bare baby bumps that lasted for most of the year. Um, there was also uh, Olivia Rodrigo, who we've been a big fan of ever since um, Driver's License came out uh, at the beginning of 2021. Um, and she has just had such a stunning rise and, you know, won multiple Grammys and then launched her first big tour. And at her tour opener uh, in Portland, Oregon, um, she's got a very strong cover game, uh, but she covered... Um, See There by Brooke Assault, uh, this great 1994 alt-rock classic, uh, and that absolutely brought a smile to our face. Um, she thanked her mom for introducing her to that music, um, which gave it an extra, you know, uh, bit of heartwarming. It also um, makes as me you feel had... quite old hearing that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it certainly was a vibe around the office, but we appreciated it anyway. I'm sure. Also, social media stars, they seem to have quite the year all of their own with some mega viral videos. So who kept you following and smiling this year? Well, there's obviously the corn kid uh, introduced on a segment of recess <laughs> therapy from uh, Julian Shapiro Barnum. Um, this little kid, Tariq, who just absolutely loved corn. Um, and, you know, it certainly didn't hurt that the Gregory brothers of, you know, uh, the autotune musicians um, of viral fame uh, put his put his corn comments uh, in song form that took off a little as well. But before you knew it, Tariq was everywhere. Um, so that just kept making us file from August on. Um, There's also Dylan Mulvaney. Um, who is a trans TikTok star who has been um, documenting her journey uh, in this series called Days of Girlhood. And on day 222, she was invited to visit Joe Biden at the White House to talk about uh, her experiences and the needs of the trans community. And it was just so, she was so excited and so genuinely honored to be there uh, that that was just, um, you know, it was just incredible to see her have that kind of platform and we're so excited to see uh what she does in 2023 yeah both the corn kid and dylan brought so much joy to so many people and speaking of joy house of dragon and netflix's wednesday there was a lot of tv that left us glued to our sets and our phones and plenty of memorable and uh memeable clips as well what were some of your favorites 
Negroni Spagliato with Prosecco <laughs> in it is obviously the one that, um, you know, we, it just took off as soon as there was this clip on, you know, like one of the kind of chat after shows um, between Olivia Cook and Emma Darcy, and they were kind of interviewing each other. Uh, and Olivia asked Emma what their favorite drink is. And just the way that they said it was so perfect that, um, you know, it took off on TikTok immediately. We started talking to bartenders who, you know, were getting all of these orders. It's basically just a, a take on a Negroni, but instead of gin, it's Prosecco. So it's a slightly lighter drink um, that bartenders did not mind making, it turned out. Hmm, interesting. I saw someone try it. I think it was Reese Witherspoon who said it was not great. Uh, so hmm. you need a taste for Campari. Uh, and so if, if you don't, if you don't like an Italian bitter, then it might not be for you. An important prerequisite um, there. Uh, thanks for all those uh, amazing updates. All right, Elizabeth, we appreciate it. All right, that's going to do it for this hour of morning news now, but your news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.